Hi everyone. So welcome to the live stream today. My name is Inshira Premium and I'm really excited for having you on the live stream today as we continue with our discussion in the IFRS masterclass, looking at one of the uh, fundamental accounting standards that we need to know about and pay attention to when it comes to financial reporting and corporate reporting. Now, so we are going to conclude today on IAS 33 and in special in case you missed the part one which we dealt with and also possibly you missed the issue relating to the IAS 2, IAS 8, IFRS 5 uh, and IAS 10, the other standards that we have covered previously, you can check the description of this video on YouTube and you can watch the entire playback so you can follow through well in order for you to uh, be able to prepare well for the examination and pass the exam. So welcome to the stream today. And in the next few minutes, we want to wrap up our discussion on IAS 33 and in per share. I see some of you guys joining. You are welcome. Give us a thumbs up on the video. It helps us a lot to reach a lot of students and uh, the channel will be able to be promoted uh, so that we can really impact the lives of a lot of people across the country and together become successful. If there are any questions you have, you know what to do. Put it in the comment section for me. Put it in the chat box for me. I'll be taking all your questions and providing you with some answers as well. Remember that we have all of these books available in case you need copies you can uh hit us up on the number below your screen 0501149296 so we have books available on taxation corporate reporting financial reporting public sector accounting and finance advanced audit and assurance and financial management all these books have practice questions in them that will help you to be able to study and also be able to pass the exams very well. So you can get access to all of these books either directly on Amazon because it is available globally on Amazon uh, or you can call us and uh, a hardcover relief uh, delivery can be arranged for you wherever you are located. So let's get into the discussion quickly and uh, see what we can do for today as we move ahead i see some comments coming in let's see um what do i have here rodwell marowenyo said hi sir i have a question on ias 37 what is the question you can put it in the comment section for me and i'm gonna be providing you with some answers on that and then uh akandi said uh it's giving us an emoji in the chat thank you very much and so whatever question that it is you have on uh, IAS 37, you can put it in the comment section for us and we'll be able to take it in that regard. So let me jump straight up into our discussion, IAS 33, earnings per share, the part two. Now, just a quick recap. If you remember, we mentioned that when it comes to earnings per share, there are two broad issues that we are going to be talking about, and that is the issue relating to basic earnings per share, what is happening currently, the position of the entity right now, and then diluted and in special what is going to happen in the future when we take into consideration the impact of potential shareholders and so we said that when it comes to the basic and in special there are three things that we need to understand there issue at full market price bonus issue and right issue then when it comes to the diluted and in special we also have two things there the share options and convertible financial instruments and that could be convertible loan notes or issue relating to convertible preference shares so far we have taken time to uh discuss the issues relating to the basic and in special if you remember we established some rules earlier that generally our earning special is going to be parties that is profit attributable to equity shareholders divided by the weighted average number of equity shares and we explain how that is going to be done then we said the weighted average number of equity shares computation two things must be taken into consideration the a timing ratio or what we refer to as the number of periods of the outstanding shares and also the bonus fraction. And we said the bonus fraction will come up when we are dealing with bonus issue and also right issues. And you've seen how we apply these issues uh, uh, in our discussion. So we've looked at the issue at full market price. We've looked at bonus issue as well. We want to start the day's discussion with right issue.
right issue. Now, so what is right issue? Whilst bonus issue has to do with issue of free shares to equity shareholders, right issue is issue of shares to existing shareholders at a price lower than the current or the prevailing market price. That's the concept about right issue. So yes, we are issuing new shares to the existing shareholders, but then it will be below the current market value. So for instance, if the current share price is say $4.5, we are going to give them a right price of probably something like $3.2. The idea is that share, the existing shareholders will be able to buy more shares in, based on their current ownership that they have in the company, and then they will buy those shares at a lower price generally. So in a sense, you realize that there is a bonus element coming in here. We are giving them some benefits because when they buy the share at 3.2, they can actually sell it at the prevailing market price of 4.5. And so meaning they are going to be making some profit. So it means that in the right issue also, there is some bonus element. And that bonus element must be dealt with and applied when calculating the earnings per share of the entity. So let's look at some one-liners and then we get excited into uh, in our discussion. So right issue, it refers to the issue of shares to existing shareholders at a price below the current market price in the proportion of current ownership, in a proportion of current ownership. So we are issuing new shares to the shareholders, existing shareholders is very important. So this one, if you are not already a shareholder, you cannot buy this. Issue at full market price, that one everybody can buy it. Bonus issue, that one you are not even buying. It's a free share you are getting. But right issue, you have to buy a new share and you are an existing shareholder of the entity. And that is the idea about right issue. Now, because we issue the shares at a price below the prevailing market price, what happens is that we have to compute the bonus fraction. And this is where the journey is going to get a little bit interesting. So I want you to make sure you stay with me very carefully here. So we have to calculate the bonus fraction. So in the context of right issue, what is the bonus fraction? Very simple. The bonus fraction is going to be the current share price, which will always be given to you, uh, divided by the X right price, which you have to calculate. So under right issues, we calculate the bonus fraction as the current share price of the company's shares. What is the prevailing share price at the time that we did the right issue? Divided by the X rights price. Now the X rights price must be calculated. And as we explain in under bonus issue, bonus fraction applies to only shares outstanding prior to the right issue. And the same rule applies here. The same rule applies here. So the bonus fraction will affect only shares outstanding prior to the right issue. So this is the idea generally about right issue and what we need to do about it. So let's crunch some numbers quickly. Let's crunch some numbers quickly. So a very simple illustration here. Again, remember I mentioned that I'm taking these simple, simple illustrations to, you know, bring out the concept because later on we're going to take some complex question and put the pieces together in one question. So stay with me very carefully here. So this question is available in the book. For those of you who have a financial reporting or the corporate reporting book, this question is in there. If you don't have it, you can just take a screenshot of the question. It's very simple there. What is the requirement here? We are supposed to calculate the earnings per share of uh, Machin Limited if the profit of the tax is $10 million for the year ended 31st December 2020. So our year ended is 31st December 2020. So if our year ended is 31st December 2020, let's read and let's see exactly what is going on. Machin Limited 
So I'm going to put up our solution here and put up our company app. So Machin Limited had an issue $1, 100,000 shares and made a right issue of three for five and made a right issue of three for five. Now remember, three for five means we give you three new for five that you currently own. Three new for five that you currently own. Most importantly, the date of the transaction is 1st August 2020 at 4.20. Then the examiner is saying that the share price at the date of the issue was $6.5 per share. $6.5 per share. So we need to find out exactly what is going on. Now, if the year ended is actually 31st December 2020, that is our year ended 31st December 2020, mm -hmm. then it means the year began on 1st January 2020. So 1st January... 2020 to 30th September 2020. That represents nine months. Nine months. Nine months. Am I right on that? Um, no, this is August. Sorry. So August before September. So this represents seven months, I guess. So up to July, rather, because it's first August. So up to 31st July. So it's going to represent seven months. Seven months. So for that seven months, we were having outstanding shares of 100,000. For that seven months, we were having outstanding shares of 100,000. Very important. And we, can't, we will restructure very well, so don't worry. Then on 1st August 2020, to the year ended 31st December 2020, that's going to be the remaining five months. So how many shares will be outstanding then? So we need to find out <clears throat> about the number of shares that they did in the right issue. So number of shares from right issued. Remember they said three for five, so you get three new for every five you are having. And so that's going to be three over five times 100,000. So we work that out quickly. Three over five times 100,000. And that gives us 60,000 shares. So it means that from the first August, the number of shares now will be 160,000. Are you okay? 160,000. 160,000. So this is the number of shares in issue for that period. 160,000. 160,000. Now remember, because it is a right issue, we would have to calculate the bonus fraction. So stay with me carefully, and let's see how we calculate the bonus fraction. Remember we said the bonus fraction is equal to the share price divided by the x right price. And we said the share price will always be given, but we have to calculate the theoretical x right price. So how do we calculate the theoretical x right price or the x price? It's the same thing. So calculation of x right price. So the way we calculate this is to use a couple of assumptions and work yourself out. So you're going to put shares here, you put value here. Then currently, we are told that if you own five shares, the share price in the question, sorry, it should be here, is 6.5. So five by 6.5. 
Okay, that's our current position. Then under the right issue, you get three new shares, but that one you paid, how much are we paying for the three new shares? $4.2 per share. Is it 4.2? Yeah. 4.2. So currently, if you own five shares, that is at 6.5. Under the right issue, you get three more at 4.2. So we multiply up 5 by 6.5. That's 32.5. 3 by 4.5. That's 12.6. So what does that mean? After the issue, you now have eight shares, which are going to be valued at 45.1 together. So your X right price is the $4.5 divided by eight. And that gives us an amount of $5.6, $5.6. Now, you see, for those of you who are doing financial management or who did financial management, there is a deeper implication of the X right price because it is the, that is why it is called a theoretical X price. It is like the new market value after the issue. Okay, it is like the new market value after the issue, but really, we are not that is not it is just a theoretical value uh, in financial management. The shares are still going to be traded at 6.5, the current share price. But we do this calculation to assume that this is how the share price is, and that is theoretical. That is why usually it is called theoretical X right price because that is not really the prevailing trading. Uh, amount but it is calculated as the new price like i said it's implication we don't really need it in financial reporting and corporate reporting so let's now go and calculate our bonus fraction since we have the x right price now so our bonus fraction will be the current share price which is given to us in the question 6.5 dollars divided by the theoretical x price that we just calculate calculated 5.6 now what you want to do is that don't punch it out leave your answer like that because you don't want to punch it out get a decimal and try to you know um how do we call it and try to approximate so we're going to leave it like that and use the absolute figure so now that we have this bonus fraction, we can then pull up our schedule and do our calculation for the weighted average number of equity shares. So what do we do? You know that already. We bring in the period. Now, just like what we did here, so I could literally go copy this guy. Could just copy this. And bring it up there it is because we need period da, 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 there we go now so stay with me for this question we saw the illustration here first january 2020 to 31st july 2020 so 1 1 2020 to 7 2020 we were having hundred thousand shares then from 1st, 8, 2020 to 31, 12, 2020, we now have 160,000 shares. All right. Then we calculated the timing ratio. This is 7 over 12. This is 5 over 12. Remember, our bonus fraction will affect only shares outstanding prior to the right issue. And we calculated the bonus fraction here to be 6.5 divided by 5.6. So we bring that up, 6.5 divided by 5.6. So that is how we 
calculate out the issue relating to the bonus fraction. Remember, bonus fraction only affects shares prior to the right issue. So we multiply these up, 6.5 over 5.6, multiply by 7 over 12 by 100,000, and I'm getting 67, 6, 709, or 708 rather, 67, 708. Then we punch the last one, 160,000 times 5 over 12. And that is 66,667. You add it up, and that gives you the weighted average number of equity shares, the wings. So that's going to be 67, 708 plus 66, 667. And that gives us 13, 4, 3, 7, 5. Let me write, rewrite that. 13, no, it should be 1, 3, 4, 3, 7, 5. So that is our weighted average number of equity shares. So you see how when there is right issue, we go about it. That's how you do go about it for right issue. But you're not done because you just have the wins. Now we can calculate the basic earnings per share. So the basic earnings per share will be equal to the profit after tax as given in the question, $10 million. Divided by the weighted average number of equity shares, one, three, four, three, seven, five, to get our answer to be $74.42, or we can multiply by $100, so we can get our answer around 704 cents, the smallest unit of the currency. This is how we deal with calculation of earnings per share when we have right issues when we have right issue. This is how we deal with it. Any questions? Any questions? You put it in the chat for us. If there are any questions that you have, you put it in the chat for us and we'll be able to, you know, take it there. Let's see what we have. Uh, David Boatin said, great job. Thank you. Abdul Rezak Salisu said, thanks, sir. For these lectures, always a pleasure. I see some of you guys joining. You are welcome. Give us a thumbs up on the video when you join. Remember to also share the video. Let's reach as many students as possible. But most importantly, let me hear from you in the comment section if there are any questions and something that you would want me to share with you. So that is right issue. We are done. Issue of new shares to existing shareholders in proportion of their current ownership in proportion of their current ownership. All right. So that's all about the basic earnings per share. Let's now go to the second category, diluted earnings per share. So like we explained earlier, diluted earnings per share has to do with looking at earnings per share from the perspective of uh, future shareholders. In other words, what will happen to the current earnings should certain events happen in the future? Should certain events happen in the future? So there are two things here. We have the share option, and then we have the issue relating to uh, convertible loan notes. So let's begin the journey first with convertible financial instruments. convertible financial instruments. Now, note that primarily or by default, these financial instruments may be accounted for in accordance with IFRS 9 financial instruments. But then because they are convertible, we're going to look at their impact currently on the financial statement and see what exactly we need to do in that particular case, to see what exactly we need to do in that regard. Now, so let's look at it and let's see what we have to do when it comes to this particular one. 
Now, in a simple language, it is a convertible financial instrument. So it could be convertible or not, like we said in the introduction. Okay, convertible or not. Number two, or preferences. Convertible preferences. Convertible preferences. Note that preferences by their nature will be liabilities. Okay, will be liabilities. But what we are going to do under diluted and per share is that we're going to work with some assumptions so that we can validate it and then work our way out. The first assumption we're going to use here is that the bondholders have converted. Okay? The convertible financial instrument holders have converted into shares. So that is the first assumption that the holders of the convertible financial instrument the holders of the convertible financial instrument have converted and taken shares okay they have converted and they are taking share they have taken the shares that's the first assumption we work with now because we are going to assume that they have converted now it, on the date of conversion they may decide to take our money we don't care but the, 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 the mere fact that there is that component of option that they can convert it means potentially we have more going to, we are going to have more shareholders in the future so we want to build that potential shareholders implication into the financial statement today so that the sh current shareholders will understand that, okay, if you are earning $74 per share now, wait, because if this convertible loan note holders convert, you may not be earning that. Okay, so it is the idea of trying to bring the future into the present and finding out the it implication on the earnings per share of the entity. So that is the first assumption. The second assumption is that because we are going to be converting or the holders have converted, it means the entity will no longer pay for the interest expenses on the loan notes. So the interest payments are cancelled. All right. So the entity has no obligation to pay any interest the entity has no obligation to pay interest why because they, they are now shareholders now remember from kg2 you learned that interest is tax deductible so if we are no longer going to charge interest that means the entity would then lose any you know tax benefits on the interest payment. So the entity will not be entitled to the tax benefits arising from the interest on the convertible loan notes. We won't get that interest. We won't get a tax benefit. Now remember, if it is convertible financial instrument, that one, there is no tax implication about it. Because for financial instruments, even though we pay interest, it's called dividend. So usually payment to the um, uh, preference shareholders will not be recorded in the statement of profit or loss and other comprehensive income. It will be recorded instead in the statement of changes in equity. 
So you've got to be careful about the third point, the tax implication. If it is convertible preference shares, the tax implication will not come. But if it is convertible loan notes, then the tax implication will come. So please make sure you get that point very well. So these are the three assumptions that we're going to be using. For that reason, our diluted earnings per share, our diluted earnings per share will be equal to, yes, we're going to still have parties. Yes, we're going to still have wins. But this is the sweet spot. When we are in convertible financial instruments, our parties is going to be adjusted. So we're going to be using the adjusted profit uh, uh, attributable to equity shareholders. And you know the wins already that we have, we will calculate that to be calculated. So how do we go about this? How do we go about this? Very simple. So let's look at the format on how we adjust the profit. So adjustment of profit attributable to equity shareholders. Slashing our currency sign. So what are we going to do? We bring in the profit for the year. All right. Then um, we're going to be, we are not going to pay the interest, as you know already. So we will add back the interest because the people have converted. So we add back the interest on the loan notes. But remember, the tax benefit to be less. And the tax benefit to be the interest we just charged, multiplied by TR for tax rate. Multiply by TR for tax rate. You less that, and we get an interest net of tax. Okay, that's the interest net of tax. You add that to the profit for the year, and that gives you your adjusted profit of the tax. Or adjusted part, which is what you are going to be using. So this is how we get our numerator parties adjusted. This is how we get our numerator. So the, the adjustment is coming in from these two perspectives, the interest expenses and the tax benefits. Remember I said if it is a convertible loan note, the tax impact will not come, but the uh, issue relating to the interest will also not come because we don't charge that in the PL, we charge that in the other comprehensive income. So you have to be careful about the content. <coughs> you have to be careful about the context. Now, how do we get our wins here when we are dealing with convertible bonds? The weighted average is going to be simple. We're just going to have the outstanding shares at the beginning of the year, then we add the number of shares in the convertible loan notes. All right, number of shares in convertible loan notes. That's all. Now, again, the reason we are doing this adjustment is that we are assuming that they are, the holders have converted and taken the loan at the beginning of the year. That is why we are doing this. Okay, at the start of the year. So let me add that so that the assumption will be complete. So we are assuming that as at the beginning of the year, boom, they have converted already. Hence, that is why we won't bring any time in ratio. This is how we deal with calculation of diluted earnings per share if we have convertible loan notes. All right? Okay. Then let's get the last one. Then we can crunch some numbers for the two. So the second one is going to be 
Now, if there are any questions, you put it in the chat for me. I see some of you guys joining. You are welcome. Uh, this is the part two of our earning spare share uh, discussion. Uh, remember, in case you've missed the IFRS masterclass, you can check the description of this video on YouTube. We've done IAS 2, IAS 10, IAS 8, uh, IFRS 5, then IAS uh, 33, and in spare share. So you can check the description and you'll be able to see all of these videos so that you can uh, watch them and uh, be able to enjoy the masterclass throughout. Let's see what do we have. Uh, Momba said, well explained and easy to understand. Thank you. Um, Bright Jikunu said, Please, by 100, it will be uh, 7442 cents. Okay, yeah, I think that is true. In our answer that we put here, or we had here, it will be 7442. Uh, that is true. Thank you. Then uh, what else we have? We have Akariza Fofo said joined. Okay, you are welcome, Akariza. Uh, business pot said you are great, sir. Thank you. Sam D is with a thumbs up on the in the chat. Thank you, Sam. Uh, Lamin CC said many thanks as always, concise with clarity. That's great to hear. Okay, let's jump back into the discussion. So the second one is share option. Share options. Now, um. Share options, it's also covered. Remember I told you about convertible loan notes being covered traditionally by IFRS 9 financial instruments, uh, later an IAS 32 financial instruments presentation. Um, share option is also covered by IFRS 2, share-based payment. And for those of you who are doing corporate reporting, IFRS 2 is one of the fundamental standards that you need to know about when it comes to uh, the examination. So share options, share options. Like I told you in the introduction, uh, it's usually be uh, either uh, an entity undertakes a service or receives a service and the entity is going to pay that in shares. Okay, so we have equity settled transactions. Equity settled transactions. Now, you don't have to know this in the context of IAS 33. I just want to explain what the whole idea is about. So equity settled transactions simply means that, for instance, we bought an asset. The asset is $10 million. Now, instead of giving the company we bought the asset from a cash or a check of $10 million, we will give them shares in our company. That is a share option available available. Then there is another uh, issue there that we call um, cash settled based on fair value of equity shares. Here, what is happening is that we will give you cash though but the money we will give you will be based on the fair value of the shares of the company. In the first scenario, equity settled, we bought the asset, we won't give you money. We will give you shares in the company. In the second scenario, cash settled based on the fair value, we will give you cash though, but the money we will give you will be dependent on the equity shares of our, of our company. So technically, this one, you don't get shares, but you get money. So this will be out in the context of earning spare share. Then the third scenario is where we've, uh, we've received a service and we are paying in terms of equity. And so that could be an incentive to our employees. For instance, share options are a great way to keep our employees generally in that regard. So for instance, we will say that, okay, if the employee is able to work for the company for say a number of years, Okay, be in the employment of the company for a number of years. Or help the company to achieve a specific valuation level. Maybe you want to be a Fortune 500 company. 
we want to be uh, maybe a, a trillion dollar company or we want to be a billion dollar company. Help us to achieve that. Or uh, sale of a sp uh, specific number of units of the product. Specific number of units. Then you will be able to buy shares in the company at a certain fixed price at the date that the announcement was made. And if you are a follower of, you know, Elon Musk and what he does, he takes a lot of share options because that's how he gets paid generally at the end of the day. So shareholders give him those targets. Okay, we want to be a Fortune 500 company. You achieve it, you get the share option. We want to be a trillion dollar company. You achieve it, you get this. We want to be, uh, we want to sell a certain number of units of the Tesla vehicles. If you achieve that, you get this. These are the concept of share options. Like I said, this is covered in IFRS 2. For financial reporting students, you don't necessarily have to understand this, but I want to give you the premise of why it is coming on board. So just like what we did, we are going to assume that these share options are exercised. So that is the only assumption that we're going to be having here, that the share options are exercised at the beginning of the year. So if the share options are exercised at the beginning of the year, it means the number of shares of the company will go up. Will they exercise? We don't know. Would they meet the criteria? We don't know. But we are assuming that as far as we have made the announcement, it is likely to be exercised. All right? So the assumption here is that the share options are exercised share options are exercised at the beginning of the year. Well, let's put it this way, at the start of the year. Okay, they are exercised at the start of the year. That is the assumption. Please note, share options have no P and L implications, so there is no adjustment to the you know, uh, earnings per share here. So what is going to happen is that when we are dealing with a share option, this is how we go. A diluted earnings per share will be equal to our profits of the tax or parties, if you want to, not to be adjusted. So we will use whatever is given to us in the question. Then we divide that by the weighted average number of equity shares, definitely to be calculated. <laughs> As always, that will be calculated. That will be calculated. So when there is share option, how do we calculate the weighted average number of equity shares? We follow three steps. So calculating the wins. Now, because here, what's happening is that, like I explained, work for the company for five years. If you do, you'll be able to buy shares at $10 per share. So maybe we are in 2022, generally, and then we are saying that work for the company for five years. Now, after five years, probably the share price is now $75. But you will buy it at $10 and sell it at $75, and that is your profit or gain for working for us for five years. I hope you are getting the idea. That is the profit or gain for working for us for five years. So you realize that we are discounting the shares for you. And literally, the company is losing something at the end of the day. So the first thing we do is to calculate what we call percentage of dilution. We calculate the percentage of dilution. Now, the percentage of dilution is going to be equal to, very simply, the share price given to us, then the exercise price, how much uh, they are going to be paying. You divide that by the share price. 
times 100. So our answer will be in X percent. That's the first thing, the percentage of dilution. So in the context of my scenario here, the excise price is $10 per share. Then the current share price could be $75 or whatever. It's just an illustration. We'll take a question right now, you will see. Once you do that, number two, we need to calculate the number of shares in the option. We calculate the number of shares in share option. How do we do that? Very simple. The number of shares in the option is simply going to be the percentage of dilution, which you calculated in stage one, multiplied by the share option. Once you have that, you can now calculate your weighted average number of equity shares, which is going to be your outstanding shares plus the number of shares in the option from step two. From step two. So these are the three steps we go through in the calculation of the weighted average number of equity shares when we are dealing with share option. So number one, we calculate the percentage of dilution. Number two, we calculate the number of options in the shares. And number three, we can then calculate the weighted average number of equity shares. These are the things we do when it comes to dealing with this aspect of it. So now that we've built this understanding, let's crunch some numbers and try to make sense of exactly what we are looking at here. Let's make sense of exactly what we are looking at here. Any questions for me? Any questions, you put it in the chat or you put it in the comment session for us and uh, we're gonna be answering that for you in that case. Abdullah uh, Razak, sorry, Abdul Razak said, following attentively, awesome to hear that. So let me bring back my screen and then Let's pick a question. Let's pick a question. Now, those of you with our, if you are enrolled in our full courses online, this question is available in your question kits uh, on page 10 in your question kits. If you are enrolled in our financial reporting or corporate reporting class online, this is available in your question kit. If not, you can take a screenshot of it as well as displayed on your screen and you'll be able to you know, write it out or follow through with it. So let's look at it. Stay with me carefully because here we are going to put everything together technically under diluted and in special. So stay with me very carefully. What do we have? It says that calculate the fully diluted and in special. Fully diluted and in special. So let's go. Flanagan makes up his account to 31st December each year. To 31st December each year. So that is the time the account is made, 31st December each year. And has calculated the basic earnings per share based on actual shares of 1 million and earnings of 500 million for the year ended 31st December 20x5. So before I get excited, I can calculate the basic earnings per share. Please know that anytime the examiner says calculate diluted earnings per share, you have to start first with the basic earnings per share. So profit of the tax or parties, since we've been flying with that, let's stay with it, over our wins. Now, remember in the exam, or you write these in full, right? If you don't go do shots cut. So 500 million divided by 1,000 million. So let's get a basic earnings per share. That's $0.5. Or if you multiply that by 100, you may get 50 cents. If you multiply that by $100, you'll 
you may get 50 cents. So anytime the examiner says calculate diluted earnings per share, we have to first calculate what? The basic earnings per share. So this is the basic earnings per share. This is what the reality is now. This is what current shareholders are going to be getting. But something is about to happen to them. So let's see. Convertible debentures. On 31st October 2016, Flanagan had in issue 10 million of 0 0.5 convertible loan notes. The loan note is convertible at the following date with the following terms. Stay with me. 31st December 20x6, that is a year from now, 150 shares for every $100. Then two years from now, 120 shares for every $100. So it means that we would have to adjust the profit for the year and build into consideration this. If you remember, we said if we are dealing with the issue about convertible debt, we are assuming that the holders are converting their shares right now at the beginning of the year. For that reason, we won't pay interest. For that reason, we lose the tax benefit that we are supposed to get. So we will use that same assumption to try to make the various adjustments here. So let's first calculate or adjust the uh, profit for the year. So adjustment of profit after tax. So let's go. The profit for the year is 500 million. Five hundred. Then we're going to add the interest on the loan. Stay with me. They said zero point five ten million. So let's work that out. Ten million by five percent, and that is zero point five. Then we we'll less the tax. The tax will be, what was the tax rate given to us? 20%. So it's going to be 0.5 million by 20%. And that is 0 0.1. So now the interest net of tax is 0 0.4. We add it up and our adjusted profit after tax It's going to be 500.04. Sounds good. 500.04. So that is the adjusted earnings. Then which of the conversion do we use? We have two here. Remember, we are assuming that they are converting right now. They are converting at the beginning of the year. So even though there are two options, we use the one that is closest, okay? Or we use the earliest year, which is the 20 X's. So let's look at the number of shares that they will get in the convertible loan notes. So number of shares on conversion. Let's work that out. They said for every hundred dollars, you get 125. Remember, we owe them 10 million over 100 dollars times 125 shares. Okay, so let's see how many shares we can get in the context of this question. And that is one or 12.5 million. So the, we will get 12.5 million shares. 12.5 million shares. Are you following the picture? Well, 12.5 million shares. Now, assuming that this question was just convertible loan notes, then what would have happened is that our wings will be the original shares, which is 100 or 1,000 million, plus the shares from the 
conversion 12.5 million and that would have given us 1012.5 million so assuming it was just the convertible or not, then this would have been our wins. Then in that case, our diluted earnings per share would have been the adjusted profit we just had, 504 million, 0 0.04 million, divided by 112.5 million. All right? So we punch that out. And that is about $49, 0 .49, 0 $49 or 49 cents. So you see that originally our basic earnings per share was 50 cents. When we took into consideration the implication of the conversion, now the earnings is going to be 49 cents. So what are we trying to do? Like I said, we are trying to let shareholders understand the reality on the ground that, hey, listen, if these people had converted this year, you wouldn't have had the 50 you are getting. Instead, you will get 49. But remember, the question didn't say we should do this. He said we should do fully diluted. So there is a second scenario which is the share option. So let's look at that. Flanagan also granted 100 million shares at the same date. The option is 2.5, but the average fair value is $4. Okay, so if there is a share option, we need to work it out. So let's go work out the share option. So with a share option, we are interested in the weighted average number of equity shares. So we said we calculate the percentage of dilution. So our percentage of dilution will be the current share price given to us to be $4 and the excise price 2.5. So 4 minus 2.5 divided by 4 times 100. Remember the excise price will always be less than the fair value always always because if not then it loses its potency of being an incentive and so that is 37.5 percent so that is the percentage of dilution step two if you remember we said we then have to calculate um how do we call it the number of shares in the option in the share option. And we said that is going to be the percentage of dilution, 37.5, multiplied by the share option. In this question, we are told the share option is 100 million. So 37% of 100 million, that's gonna be 37.5 million shares. Okay, so assuming exclusively, it was just share option, then our weighted average number of equity shares would have been the 1,000 million, what was outstanding at the beginning of the year, plus the 37.5 million. So in that case, our weighted average number of equity shares would have been 137.5 million. So assuming it was just share option, share options, then this will be the number of equity shares, the weighted average number of equity shares. In that case, if it was share option alone, then our diluted earnings per share would have been, remember the profit will not be affected. So our profit will still be the original profit of 500 million, but this time around divided by 1037.5 million. So let's punch that out. Let's see what we get. So 500 divided by 1037.5. And that is 
dollars sorry 0 0.48 dollars or if you want 48 cents if we should multiply by 100 dollars so it means that we are telling shareholders that assuming we're having only share options then your future earnings or your earnings would have been 48 dollars sorry 48 cents so even though on the basic earnings level you are getting 50 cents if the share option was there you would have had 48 if they had converted you would have had 48 then again that is not what the examiner said we should do the examiner didn't say calculate the diluted earnings per share for the a convertible loan note b share option no he said fully diluted so we're going to put the impact of the two together and that is the answer of, to the question so to calculate the fully diluted earnings per share it means we have to take into consideration everything in the scenario so if you are taking into consideration everything in the scenario then our patterns will be the adjusted patterns which, if you remember, our adjusted patterns will be 500.04. Because you are taking into consideration both the impact of the convertible loan notes and the share option. Then our wins will be the outstanding, which is the 1,000 million, plus the shares that will come in from the loan notes which is 12.5 million plus the shares that will come in in the share option which is 37.5 that will become the weighted average number of equity shares so that's going to give us 12.5 37.5 that is 50 so our shares will become 1050 million 1050 million so in the context of that our diluted fully diluted earnings per share will be the adjusted profit which is the 500.04 divided by the weighted average number of equity shares, 1050 million. So we punch that out. And that is 40, no point four, maybe seven six or maybe no point four eight dollars. Or if we should multiply by hundred dollars, then that will be forty-seven point six cents, or maybe forty-eight cents. This is the answer to the question: fully diluted earnings per share. Fully diluted earnings per share. So what we are telling the shareholders is this: that hey. Your basic earnings per share, basic EPS, we calculated that earlier, it's 50 cents, <clears throat> 0 $0.5 or 50 cents. But right now, should the bondholders convert and the share option also exercise, you guys are going to get 47.6 cents. And so you're going to be losing some money. So the percentage of dilution here, let's see. The true percentage of dilution should be maybe 50 minus 47.6 over 50 times 100. Meaning that there is a reduction of about 5% for us in that case. A reduction of about 5% for us in that case. That is the idea about fully diluted and special. And that's all about an special generally, generally, generally. So 
again, going over it quickly. Always calculate your basic earnings per share. Then the loan notes, we do the adjustment that has to be done. Then we pretend to calculate the diluted earnings per share, but that is not what the examiner said we should do. The share option, go through the stages on how the calculation has to be done. Then you deal with a fully diluted earnings per share. That is what you must understand generally when we talk about earnings per share. When we talk about earnings per share. Any questions for me? Any questions? Any questions? That's the idea about earnings per share. So the rule here now then will be, once you have now understood the fundamental principles, you can then go ahead and look at a lot of questions. So for instance, for those of you who are enrolled in our full courses, in your question kit, you realize that there is a lot, there are a lot of questions in there that you can look at on the earnings per share. Just a lot of questions. And we do this for each of the standards. A lot of questions that you can look at, and then you check it out and you see whether you'll be able to apply the principles very well. That is the issue about that. And that is what we must understand generally when we talk about earnings per share, which is IAS 33. Which is IAS 33. So we're going to be wrapping up today, uh, generally here. We're going to be concluding around here today. And uh, God willing, next week we will uh, continue with our discussion on Monday. You follow us on Instagram and also uh, subscribe to the channel. The meeting is going to be uh, scheduled and you're going to know the next issue that we're going to be touching on. So this week we have tried to spend some time with IFRS 15, revenue from contract with customers, and then IAS 33, and in spare share. Last week, we dealt with IAS 2, IAS 10 as well, and then IAS 8, right? So make sure that you go through these very well as you prepare yourself for the examination so that you can pass the exams. So that's it about that. Thank you very much for joining us on the stream today. Really excited for having you guys joining us always. And continue to study. Week 6 is over. So, I mean, next week we are going into week 7. And uh, we, are, we are more than half in the journey. And uh, you got to be working hard. So that's it about that. Have a great weekend. And I'll catch you same time next week as we continue with our discussion. Stay safe and stay blessed.